public have the mistaken idea that we are experts is to identify things which people bring in. And they always make a lot of fuss about how interested they are when you tell them it's Middle Bronze Age or Late Iron Age or something of this sort of technical side, because what they really want to know is how much they're worth. And we are forbidden by the trustees from ever referring to this matter, so we are experienced in dealing with all sorts of drama. And it happened to me once when I was on duty that a person called Douglas Simmons came in in about 1985 with a bag full of antiquities, small antiquities, which he poured onto the desk, and I was the duty officer. And it contained some coins, a couple of lamps, a bit of Chinese stuff, a couple of shabtis, and a cuneiform tablet. Well, it might not surprise you to know that I picked up the cuneiform tablet first. And um, I picked it up, and at first sight, I assumed it was going to be an old Babylonian letter. I'm sure you would have the same conclusion in terms of size, shape, dimension, grammatical forms, semantic parallels, and so forth. But I lifted it up and started to read it. And this is what came out. And I'm not going to read the whole of this book out. I should tell you, if you want to read it yourself, it is easily arranged. It's very easily arranged afterwards. <laughs> wall, wall, read wall, read wall. Atra Hussis, pay heed to my advice that you may live forever. Destroy your house, build a boat, spurn property, and save life. Well, not many letters begin that way. And in point of fact, I was able to read it at sight because I had a very demanding teacher who used to hit people and, and thrash them with barbed wire until they learned their signs. And so uh, recognizing the beginning of the flood story in the Babylonian epic was a doddle for someone who graduated from that classroom. So I realized I had in my hands a piece of the old Babylonian version of the flood story, which is a piece of gold in the world because everyone is interested in the flood story and nobody ever gets their hands on an unpublished piece which had never been seen by any other Assyriologist. So I was rather excited about it. And what happened was he took it away, picked up the lamp and said, and what about this? And when I'd gone through the rest of the material, trembling with excitement and thinking, can I borrow this for a while and read it? He went, and I didn't see him for the best part of a decade. So I knew that this thing was in circulation, and this was before the trustees of the British Museum had produced this handbook about how to um, knock people to the floor and take over their property for the trustees. So I just let him escape. But I knew that sooner or later it would come back to the British Museum because all important things do. Some of them, for example, are temporarily in the Louvre, but sooner or later they will come to us. So the thing is, uh, when I finally got this thing into my control, I had it let the luxury, to say, of reading it properly in privacy with a good light and, um, and so forth to get the guts of it out. And it became apparent that the thing was of 60 lines in length, and although the beginning was exactly the same as is attested in the other sporadic examples, the rest of it was very startling. Now, knowledge of the flood itself on cuneiform tablets has been in the public domain since 1872, when George Smith, the character on the left, for the first time was a modern human being who read a piece of uh, this dog biscuit kind of material from this barbaric background and discovered that he was reading Holy Writ virtually in this peculiar format. And the story goes in our department record, I'm sure it's true, that he dropped the tablet on the table in his anxiety and started to run around the room, holding his head and making funny squeaking noises, and eventually attempting to remove his clothing. And this has gone down in history as a laughable matter, but it's almost certain that what actually happened was he had an epileptic fit because the impact of discovering for the first time that the text of Genesis, which everybody in 19th century London knew by heart, existed in this peculiar rival form. So George Smith, um, in 1872, discovered this for the first time. There was a huge furore about it, all sorts of discussion by all sorts of people. I'd just like to draw your attention to the image of Smith 
on your left. He has the broad, intelligent forehead, leadership kind of profile, fine beard, <laughs> lucid, intelligent eyes, and so forth. There's always been this range of characteristics that the trustees have looked for in their serological <laughs> employees. <laughs> so the thing is that when Smith published this, uh, he wrote very lucidly about it and its implications for the biblical story because it contained not only the approximate parallel but a much more specific one for example the fact that when the flood was abated and, and things were quiet a series of three birds was released and only the third one came back i mean didn't come back so he knew that uh, something had appeared above dry land which is of course what noah did in the a um, more popular version of the story as celebrated in Hollywood and a really good one which you have to read in the original in Babylonian. So um, one of the interesting things about the uh, version which he discovered, that 1872 tablet, it came from the library of Ashurbanipal in the 7th century BC. It was one of the king's own personal copies of his standard literature. Um, although they didn't know that securely at the time. And when Smith made his very quick and very accurate translation, it included a description of what the ark that this um, Utnapishtim, the equivalent of Noah in his version of the story, had built. And the description comes out as a cube. That's to say an object which is um, the same height, width and length on, in all dimensions. So the clergymen, who were extremely worried about the way that the Bible had been undermined and what this might mean for the end of civilization, um, came back in force saying, well, this is rubbish. This isn't nothing like the Ark in the Bible. I mean, it's a cube. I mean, who ever had a boat that was a cube? It is mad anyway, and they would have to take notice of this. And so they were um, impelled and felt encouraged to dismiss evidence which was unwelcome to them. Of course, they were operating on the assumption that the real Noah's Ark, so to speak, looked like this. I was rather fortunate to find this contemporary photograph, which um, <laughs> is what we call research in the British Museum. It's called Google, generally. And uh, here it is, and exactly as it was, uh, reconstructed in this image according to the text of the Bible. So the situation was that in 1872 and a half, there were people who believed in the Assyrian version, there were people who stuck fast to the Bible, so you had a cube or a coffin, but of course at the same time everybody really knew uh, what Noah's Ark looked like. <laughs> it's one of these things. There's usually a giraffe looking out the window just to complete it. So in fact, Ark fanciers, so to speak, had these three alternatives at their disposal. So it made it even more astonishing when I had the leisure to read this tablet when it turned out the following thing, because um, the god Enki, um, who had discovered that the world was going to be destroyed, decided it wasn't a good matter and that he picked on some human being to build this lifeboat to rescue all life forms against the waters that would come. And um, it's always been a mystery, actually, why he picked on this Atron Harsis, whose name means extremely intelligent, because however intelligent he might have been, it is clear that Enki didn't trust his knowledge of boat building at all, because in this tablet, he tells him all the information you need to know in order to build this boat. In other words, it's one of those, like one of those boxes from Ikea, which has all the information on a mimeographed panel on the side, so when you take it home, you can build it on your own. So the first piece of information that came out of reading this tablet was that the boat was round. And I'm fairly secure about most words beginning with K, because I worked on the K volume, so I felt that the word kipatu was under my belt, but I thought I'd make absolutely sure that I hadn't misremembered it, because round boats are not something you tend to encounter in your normal life, until you remember, of course, that riverine communities all over the world have used round boats, which we called coracles, and which in Arabic are called gufa, and that in ancient Mesopotamia they certainly had boats like this, and it suddenly became a rather intelligible picture that for an old Babylonian poet who lived when he wrote that tablet in about 1800 BC, so it's a thousand years older than the Assyrian version, 
in writing about the story conceived of the ark in question, the boat to save lives, as a round coracle boat as people built on the sides of the river. And this makes a lot of sense because the thing about a coracle, if you've never been in one, you will have to take my word for it. I've been in one once. Uh, the reason is I'm the, um, I'm the president of the British Coracle Association. Don't, not a funny thing at all. I don't see why you're sniggering. This is a major, major tribute to me as a person. I am the, I, I haven't got the gold chain. It's a bit annoying, but they promised me one, and I had to go in one, so I've been in one, so I can talk about this with a great deal of familiarity. And the thing about these boats I know from many years of experience is that they don't sink. And if you've got the job of collecting up all these male and females and putting them in a boat, it doesn't have to go from Portsmouth to New York. All it has to do is float. And the coracle doesn't have a front or a back. It just floats, and they float beautifully. So that is why the poet who wrote this story, trying to visualize the thing in a realistic way, decided it was going to be a giant coracle. It certainly was going to be a giant coracle. The surface area of the plan is given, it's 3,600 square meters, so bigger than this room. And in this IKEA list of instructions, he tells him of the materials he will need, that's to say, the, um, um, the rope, which is wrapped around to build the body of the boat, the ribs made of wood, and the bitumen to coat it inside and out to make it waterproof. He not only tells him he will need these materials, but he actually tells him how much of them he will need in order to complete the job. So this is where it becomes something very remarkable. So <clears throat> this is what, of course, Iraqi coracles look like or used to look like. The one at the top on your left is a fairly modern one, one of the last ones ever made probably. And the one below that is the runner-up for the um, uh, Guinness Book of Records award for the most males um, ever stuffed in a single coracle with success. And in fact they were disqualified because one of them was a boy and they thought that was cheating. Um, so that's them. And then in the middle is a drawn from a lantern slide which was given to us in the museum by an old lady from her father's collection and we had it blown up and you can't see very clearly on this screen but you've got two women who are doing the grand tour and have clearly been persuaded by some slick um, organizer of um, holiday activities to go in one of these boats and sample life in real and they all look terrified so the thing is that the coracle in Iraq is known in ancient times, it's on the